Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Trey Lockerbie, and today we have Vitaly Katzenelson on the show. Welcome to the show. Trey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and you guys do a, a phenomenal job, really. Well, I'm, I'm honored because I think you just told me this is sort of the first interview kicking off your new book launch, and uh, we're going to talk a lot about that new book. I'm really uh, impressed with the, the topics covered in it, and it's refreshing, and it speaks a lot to me and my background, and we're just going to have a lot to cover today. I'm really excited about it. This is, this is great. Looking forward to it. Okay. So before we really dig into the book, in your career, you've seen a couple of these bear markets. You saw the dot-com crash. You saw the GFC, where the market kind of grinded 50% lower. In both, in both instances, it kind of grinded about 50% lower, roughly. So let's just take 2009 and thinking about where the market was around $1,500 a share for the S&P 500 at that time. Thinking about it being at five or near 5,000, like 10 years later, probably just felt inconceivable. And so right now we're seeing the S&P down about 14% from its high. That's the actual historical average for a correction. So I'm kind of curious how you're feeling about today's markets. Are we is there some number in the future that we can't even conceive of at right now? Are you finding that there should be uh, more pain ahead? Um, well, this is a great question. So when I look at this market, the market that looks very similar to is the kind of 1999-2001 correction. And if you think about what happened in 99, you basically had already kind of uh, like the, the technology stocks and dot-com stocks were already going up for many, many years, for, for, for maybe three or four years. So the market was already expensive. On top of that, you had this Y2K scare where everybody was concerned that if you take mainframes, they, that the old mainframes, once the clock switches from 1900 to 2000s, they're going to go back to 1900. So, uh, so there was a huge investment. There was a huge investment in... Um, in, in, in basically in technology. But the, techn- the, but the problem is that the investment did not just apply to mainframes, it also applied to all, you know, to all technology, right? So Dell's and Cisco's and Microsoft's, the, the demand for their products was just off the chart, you know? And, uh, but then 2000 came and kind of the world kept going. And these companies discovered, like I'm talking about right now, Cisco, Dell, Microsoft, those are very good solid companies. They discovered that the previous year or two, the sales they made pulled future sales uh, you know, forward, right? Cisco sales declined. Uh, Dell sales stagnated. Microsoft sales actually went up. But, and this is very important, but if you look what happened to the stock prices, Cisco today is still below to southern high. It took Microsoft like 13 or 14 years to get back to to southern high level. Uh, Dell, actually, I'm not sure because it went pub- it went private, uh, but most likely, uh, but but it, I think it went private at the, uh, the price that was far below the, uh, uh, the kind of to southern high. So the, why you know so th- this is point number one. So there was a lot of sales that got pulled forward during the pandemic for, the, for, for a lot of high quality digital companies, you know, like, you know, we're talking about uh, from Google to many other companies. But what's also important to understand is that when you look again at, white, at the 2000 era, those companies found that when you're growing at a very fast rate for a long period of time, you basically make an assumption that you continue to grow revenue at very fast pace. The reason it's important because you start hiring people as if you're going to do this and you have an assets base as if you're going to do this. When slow grow, uh, growth slows down, you discover that you have too many people and you have too, uh, too much assets. And, I, and, and therefore, what's, what's going to happen, you have layoffs. And, you, you know, and um, this is important because I think what happened during the pandemic, it was kind of our Y2K moment for a lot of digital companies. You know, because during the pandemic, we didn't really know how the future is going to look like post-COVID, right? And uh, a lot of these companies were basically assuming that we are kind of in the new normal, digital normal. And today, you know, they're waking up to the fact that I think the you know they pulled a lot of growth from the future. If you look at Zoom, it's basically went from a child to maturity in two years. 
right? And now it's a mature company and the earnings are re-rating. It's cost structure probably going to have to re-rate and a lot of other things. So the, the reason it's important is that because when uh, what I learned about the market, things go from one extreme to another. And, that, and the reason it's important because when valuation gets very, very high and people get overly excited, as sales growth slows down and as earnings collapse because as revenues decline, the, uh, the, you know, the cost is still high and companies now taking charges, laying off people. What's probably going to happen is that, and this is what happened in 2001, 2002, the, the companies went from being loved to being hated and completely abandoned. And you could have picked up Amazon and some other high quality companies for 90% cheaper than they were at the top. And I, so when I look at the market today and I look at the you know, darlings of yesterday, you know, that were too expensive for value investors like me, I think we'll, we'll get to the point where they will become cheap enough, you know, that we're not there yet. And uh, so I'm kind of looking through Kathy Wood's uh, arc and kind of ma- taking mental notes of companies I'd like to own that are good businesses and trying to figure out how much you want to pay for them. So this is, this is kind of on the kind of on the dot com 2.0 bubble. Um, then the, the other thing is going on in the economy today is obviously we have this significant inflation and we already had inflation before the war in Ukraine. And I think the war in Ukraine basically just added a lot more oil to the fire. And um, we, uh, I think we're going to have a, they, you know, and they basically infl- additional, in the, the, that additional fuel coming from several sources. Number one, Russia and, uh, and Belarus, so Belarus are the second and third largest exporters of uh, fertilizer, you know, of, uh, potash. And, uh, and also, so the, so the fertilizer prices are up significantly. No, potash prices are up significantly. Also, nitrogen fertilizer is basically derived from natural gas. And natural gas prices are up again because of the war. Um, or, and so I think you know, what's, what's, what's going to happen over the next couple of years, or next year at least, we're going to see most likely the cost of food will go up tremendously. Just because fertilizer is, is, is the kind of the... It's the lowest layer. It's the most important input into uh, into food prices, and so you're going to have lower yields because you know, farmers will be more stingy with fertilizers. Uh, they're going to have to raise prices for corn, for anything, and so so you're going to have food inflation. Uh, now you also have a you know you're know, going to have oil prices higher, natural gas prices higher. Also, as interest rates go up, and this is this point is very important. As the housing price, you know, the, the housing prices went up tremendously. And as interest rates go up, their impact on housing is going to be significant. Let me give you an example. Average, the median house in the United States costs about $450,000. As a 30 year mortgage goes from 2.8% to 5.2%, that difference is about $7,000 more a year of interest payments. Wow. That is basically if a median income in the United States household income is about sixty-five thousand dollars, that's a that's a more than ten percent of median income is going to be consumed by, uh, you know, just basically, you know. In other words, think about this: the house you were going to buy hasn't changed. You just have to pay for that, you know, you know, seven thousand dollars more in interest payments. So that's another, you know, that's another source um, of inflation. And, uh, and and on top of everything else, if you know if you were going to buy a car, the car that car now is going to be you know, and you're going to finance it. That car now became more expensive. So what we are looking at, you know, what we are looking at, this consumer has been attacked. You know, consumer has a limited budget, right? And consumer has been attacked from different directions. Now spending spending more money on food, on gasoline, on heating. On 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 you know if you know on on basically the cost of financing now is, is you know is higher, so so when we look at the economy today, I think there's a very good chance that what's happening may may, may turn the uh, may basically it's very stagflationary. This inflation will you know turn stagflationary. I don't know if it's going to send us into a recession, or maybe we're already in a recession. 
but I know this is not good for the economy. So from as a stock picker, you know, we basically, you know, what my company does, we build a portfolio of individual stocks. We have basically shifted portfolio from discretionary spending. You know, so we have very little exposure to stocks that rely on the discretionary spending from consumers because I think that's going to be the biggest, the area that will be attacked the most. That's very interesting. Just to add like a, uh, it's certainly interesting times that we're living in. I mean, you brought up Kathy Wood. Mm-hmm. She's now selling Tesla, buying General Motors. I mean, we're we're shifting into a new era a little bit. And to your point though, those those tech stocks are hopefully going to get cheap enough where folks like us can actually come in and do a Bill Miller strategy where he bought up Amazon, you know, uh, right mm-hmm. at the trough of 2009, so to speak. But just to, um, just to add sort of like a contrarian or devil's advocate of, sure. uh, take to what you just said, especially around housing, because my concern with housing is that there's just still a lot of liquidity out there and you have Blackstone and People like the, coming in and buying up hard assets because you have you have institutions now entering the market buying up some hard assets in some you know regions, major metropolitan areas, for example, mm-hmm. that could continue to drive this thing higher and higher, higher. I'm seeing it in Los Angeles, so I'm speaking from my relative experience here, mm-hmm. but I'm just kind of concerned how, how even though interest rates are going up for the consumer, it seems like these institutions are finding ways to to get enter this asset class. To continue to drive things up because it's simply a hard asset, and they're just trying to protect against inflation that way. So, no, I, that, I think that that is actually a very, very good point. What I described is, but you're right, is basically kind of con- direct impact on the consumer, right? But think about Blackstone buying these houses, right, and they rent them out. When they rent them out, those rents will be higher as well, right? So, um, and also Blackstone. You know, like the you know, kind of uh, institutional buyers, they are still a small part of the market, not the whole market, right? And if the market, if the housing prices start decline, which by the way, do you know, those things do happen, then their interest in buying houses may actually decline as well, right? So, uh, but either any way you look at it, if they buy houses and then they rent them out, they'll they'll be raised in rents, right? So if you if you're a consumer who now renting. It, that still impacts your budget, right? Because you just write in larger check to Blackstone. But that's, that's a very good point. So you mentioned Microsoft struggling for about 13, 14 years. There was sort of this lost decade, if you will, around you know, the late 90s to the you know, 2008 timeframe where the market just simply recovered to where it was. And I'm kind of curious, given that you wrote this book, this little book about <laughs> sideways markets, uh, do you see any prospect of that kind of what we're entering into where it's just going to be a decade or sort of a lost decade period where we won't recover to where we just were only a few months ago for a, a significant period of time? Yeah. No, I think actually, you know, if I had an interest in this, I would probably be re-releasing my book again, the little book of sideways markets, because we are primed for this environment. Let's let it's this is a, this is Microsoft is a, good, is a good example. Let's examine why the stock hasn't gone anywhere. Okay, um, I forget the numbers now, but Microsoft valuation was was trading sixty five or seventy five times earnings. Okay, over after that Microsoft and I'm right now doing from memory, but probably grew, grew earnings and revenues maybe fifteen percent a year. Okay, and it just took 12, 13, 14 years for Microsoft to grow into its valuation of the solvent. So its, it's price earnings went, I don't know, from 65 times earnings to 12, and even though while its earnings are growing. And this is why the saying, the price you pay actually matter, matters is so important because it does. Like, I'll, let me give you an even better example. There is this company who basically is the most important company in the wireless space, Qualcomm. Qualcomm, just think, imagine you are in 1999. And you think about the the wireless, you know, the you know the Qualcomm basically makes has a tax on every cell phone sold globally, okay? Because it has a you know it basically has a patents for three G, four G, and five G. So every time you buy a phone, about three percent of the price of the phone goes to Qualcomm. Just imagine how beautiful that business is, right? Well. If you bought Qualcomm in 1999, I think the stock was so expensive that I think it took you like 15 to 18 years to get your money back. Again, 
if you look, if you only look at the stock price, you would have seen this stock declined first, and then basically just did nothing for 15 years. While it was happening, its earnings and revenues were growing very steadily, very, very fast. It just was too expensive. So if you look at the market today, uh, overall, the market last year was very, very expensive. There was a, there was a huge, there were pockets of the market that were insanely expensive. Like if you basically look at Kathy Wood's portfolio, that was the insane part of the market. Um, and now what's, what's, what's tricky about this, the, I don't know what the economy is going to do for the next 10 years or 15 years, because today, if you think about what, where we are today, the government debt is incredibly high. And now our, our spending is not declining. So most likely we're going to have higher interest rates going forward. And that's going to be kind of the staple, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the staple of this economy. What's important to understand, we haven't really seen high interest rates since 1980s. Since 1980s, the interest rates declined. And, and we haven't seen much inflation either. So as interest rates go up, they, it's, a, it's, a, it's a headwind for the economy. And it's a headwind for the economy that got accustomed to very low interest rates. So as they go up, they basically slow, slow down our growth. So now you take this, you have high valuations, and actually, instead of being normal growth, having no normal growth, the growth going forward is probably going to be slower. So therefore, that's a recipe for very unpleasant markets. So this is why kind of today as an investor, having significant margin of safety, you know, buying companies who can still maintain the earnings power and grow in an inflationary environment and who's, you know, who's basically whose earnings are not really, or revenues are not tied to the health of you know, consumers, you know, consumers' health. That's how you survive in this environment. And I think you know, and I and I think this is probably the right and the most important time to increase your margin of safety. So if in, if in the past you were looking to buy stocks as you know dollar for sixty cents, maybe now you want to try to buy it for forty cents. Um, so that's basically how I look at the market today. Given that you focus so much on on stocks, I'm I'm curious because there's a, an adage that. The stock market is where you should go during times of inflation. This is kind of, you hear both sides of this argument, but, but essentially the theory is that these companies can raise prices, which then increases earnings and it kind of washes out through inflation. Is that your kind of approach to, you know, to maintaining with stocks? Are you operating with that philosophy saying, meaning if we're entering the secular time frame where interest rates will just continue to go up, you know, as long as we, you know, for the foreseeable future, mm-hmm. is stocks even better, even though the economy might be suffering, are stocks generally the asset class you want to focus on? So, okay. So think about stock price. Look, I'm, ignore dividends for a second, okay? Stock price goes up or down in the long term for two reasons, in combination of these two reasons. Earn, earnings of growth, earnings growth, and change in price to earnings, okay? So even if number we just we produce stays the same and we have inflation, the um, the economy is gonna ha- no the um, the G- GDP will grow in the nominal terms right so therefore a lot of companies will be able to some companies will be able to grow earnings better than others during the inflationary environment right so but in gen- in general earnings will grow with inflation so that's a, that's a good news the bad news is that the price to earnings which is still very high will contract because when your interest rates are low, you are discount, discounting the future at low interest rates. When you have high inflation and high interest rates, the future is a lot less, is a lot less exciting. You know, there's high interest rates. So you, it's a combination of two things. Nominal, so the, the inflation is good for nominal. So stocks will benefit because in general, companies will be able to raise prices and it's going to show up in their nominal earnings. But price earnings will decline which will wash away some of the gains you get you know, from earnings growth. So this is why it's kind of a tricky environment. And, and then you want to own companies that have pricing power. Not, not like as, as an example, if you are a retailer that has exposed to a lot of discretionary spending, you will be the casualty of inflation because consumers will have less money to spend at your stores. 
if you're a grocery retailer, you're probably going to be okay. As, as an example, right? Like Warren Buffett, uh, like when somebody asked them, what are the best, um, uh, what are the, the best tax to own during the inflation environment? He said, you want to own a claim on somebody else's revenues. Just think about this. I'll give you a couple of examples. And I'm not saying those are good stocks. I'm just giving you examples of businesses. Uh, they think of McDonald's. They collect uh, franchise fees from fr- their franchisees. As franchisees' revenues go up, McDonald's costs don't change as much, but they, that whatever, 5 or 7% they charge, that nominal number goes up. Another one would be, let's say, MasterCard or Visa. Right again, it's a claim they collect. I don't know, fifty, you know, fifty basis points or one percent of every transaction. Right, as the dollar volume goes up, just because of inflation, if, even if we don't produce more wid- widgets, their revenue goes up, even though they have a much, you know, the costs don't go up as much. Um, so you have, but in other words, so the let me give a couple examples of companies we own. So we own comp- pipelines. Okay, if you think about a pipeline, you basically have fixed assets that have almost an infinite life. You know, if you, if you, you know, uh, if you just maintain your pipeline, those assets have an almost infinite life, okay? And, and uh, when pipeline build those assets, that's in the yesterday's earning, yesterday's cost. Now, they are able to raise prices with inflation. A lot of the contracts allow them to raise prices with, uh, with CPI, PPI. So their, their revenues go up where their costs are mostly fixed and don't change. The, what's also important to understand, maintenance capital expenditures for pipelines are very, very small. And th- this is a, like when you look at the business, when you look at the business, you want to look how much uh, maintenance capital expenditures they have in relation to the assets. In case of pipelines, those, those maintenance capital expenditures, I'll give an example, um, we own enterprise products, which has about $8 billion uh, operating cash flows. Um, their maintenance capital expenditures are about $500 million. And I'm, I'm being conservative. So if that maintenance capital expenditures goes up 30%, the revenue, you know, like let's say we have this runaway inflation, the revenue go, going up by 10%, that contributes $800 million. Okay, you know, $800 million, you know, if, if, uh, if, uh, if the costs go up by, you know, 30%, that now, you know, their margins too can be much, much healthier. Anyway, as an example, so those, uh, that's how we basically position portfolio, kind of one stack at a time. Given that you've seen a couple of these big correction periods, are there any tips or tricks you've picked up? Because obviously as things get cheaper, it's exciting, but there's always that fear of catching a falling knife, for example. So are there any indicators that let you know, okay, we're nearing the bottom, we're getting there. A lot of times, you you know, it's X amount of companies hitting their 52-week low or whatever it might be, just general, general indicators that you uh, are watching closely right now. Um, I, you usually look for something else. You look for when, when the technology stocks decline today and there's still interest in buying them, that usually tells me that's too soon. It's when people start treating them as radioactive waste. And like, so they, I remember like in the 99.com, companies would, would rename their name to .com and the stock would go up 30% just on the renaming, you know, just on changing its name. And, and then 2001, 2002, .com, companies would scrape off the name, .com from the name because it became radioactive. So, at some point, we're going to have this, you know, the tech stocks, you know, they, you know, they are still darlings. At some point, they will become kind of radioactive and nobody wants to write about them. Nobody wants to talk about them. You know, nobody wants to show them in their portfolio. This is when you want to buy them. That's number one. Number two, what I learned is that, like, we go, and I already mentioned it, we go from one extreme to another. We go from love to hate. And so you're probably going to be able to buy these companies. It's very, it's like in this environment, it's very dangerous to look what the valuations were over the previous five or 10 years. This is this point, actually, this is probably the most important point I can make about this. Uh, in this environment, when we analyze companies, we focus on absolute valuations. In other words, what is this company, what is this company worth just based on its cash flows? It's very dangerous today you look at a company, let's say it's declined 50%, and you say it's only trading at 
15 times revenues. Okay. Because and now it's cheap because it used to trade at, I don't know, at 40 times revenues. Okay. Well, the problem is that 40 number that was wrong. And, and, and so it could be that 15 uh, times revenue number as well. So you really should look at the, do the best job you can, figure out what the earnings power of this company is or is going to be and value those cash flows. And that's how you arrive to the price. What do you think it's worth? And then you want to still take a haircut and say, I want margin of safety. If the future is not as bright as, you know, as I think, it, you know, uh, which it may not be. So when we study value investing, we come to this conclusion kind of that we want to buy and hold, or at least that's sort of the often uh, conflation between the, the, the strategy and what other value investors are saying. And you kind of take it as, the, uh, as gospel. You've written a book about active value investing. So I'm kind of curious over the next 10 years, how active is too active and how active is too little active? You know, if we want to see the, these environments shifting as quickly as they have been, you know, when should we just buy and turn the screens off and wait 10 years versus, you know, maybe managing actively? I'll give you a couple answers. Number one, like every, like uh, the kind of this continuous bull markets train you to buy and hold, right? Because every single time you sold it in the past, price earnings got higher and higher, right? Not a lot of times, not because the earnings grew, it just investors were willing to pay more and more, Okay. If we are entering into sideways markets, the opposite happens. The price to earnings keeps declining, right? And they and they actually they teach you at the end, you, you want to be buying and selling all the time. The truth is somewhere in the middle. So if you want a company that is like your next Apple, and when I say next Apple, meaning company can compound earnings at 20% a year for the next 20 years, you want to buy it and it does the it's you know this earnings growth will overcome almost any comp- PE compression, you know that the market will throw at it, right? So in that case, you want to be kind of a, continue to be buy and hold investor, because it, just because it, you know the company has a very high return capital, and has a huge growth runway ahead of it, you know has a moat, and you know then then you know then. You know, be be buy and hold investor with this stock. That's those are exceptions, though, right? So in the during the sideways markets, you want to buy companies when they're undervalued. When they get to fairly valued level, you you, you want to sell them. And it's not a, you know it's not trading. It's a basically just your realization that that extra bonus that you used to receive from price earnings going from below average to average to much above average is kind of it's. That's kind of the staple of the bull markets, not the sideways markets. Thank you for that. So now I want to kind of transition a little bit into your book because it is a topic that we actually strive to cover on the show. While we love the tactical investing things, I think we're all here to learn more about the philosophies to just live a more meaningful life because I think there's a lot of synergies between investing and living a meaningful life that you explore in this new book. So I've often said that you know I came to investing and stayed for the philosophy, and you you write something kind of similar in the book. And something I actually learned from the book that I didn't know is that uh, the actual ancient Greek translation of philosophy is quote unquote love of wisdom. That's right. And when you study successful people enough, you you often find this common denominator that they're just these voracious learners. And you, like me, I think were not a great student earlier in life, um, and so. I'm kind of wondering where they, where things kicked into high gear for you when when you found your quote unquote love of wisdom enough to where you decided to spend your life studying it. That, that is a, such a great question. I'm going to give you a kind of a longer answer to this question. So what we're here for. No, all right. <laughs> um, all right. So the okay. So let's talk about writing first. Okay. So because I think that's part of the answer. So I started writing in 2004. Okay. Um, at that point, I had a one. I had a child. I had my son was you know Jonah was three, you know three or three or four years old. I had my graduate. I completed my graduate degree in finance, and I was teaching actually investment class at CU Denver. And Street.com was looking for writers, and they were not paying anything, which was great because if they you know they were by not paying me anything, they were paying. So I started writing. I started writing for the Street.com. And I realized I really liked writing. And I, I got I to admit, my, like, 
I hope they don't have an archive of my articles because you read my my early articles, they were incredibly boring because I had a very little self-confidence and I wanted to make sure that all my numbers were right to the, to the decimal and it were very proper and very boring. And then one day I wrote about, uh, this is maybe 2005, my son is four years old. And at the time I had this TiVo device that would sit on top of your cable box. And I and I had issues with that box and I called TiVo. And remember, this is 2004, 2005. And the voice, you know, so they had a voice um, recognition uh, software that asks you a question and you have to answer it. And as you can tell, I have an accent. And so I would speak to the, I would, you know, I would speak to the uh, recording and it would like to the phone, it would not understand me. And then my, my four or five year old son here is playing. And what I had to do I gave him the phone and I, and I told, and I basically would tell him what to say into the phone. And Jonah spoke with this perfect Disney accent. And this is how I could communicate with, you know, with Steve customer support, why it's important. What I just told you, I wrote a small article about this, like 500 words. And on this response to this article was so great. Okay. Oh, it was like I got more emails and feedback than I, on anything else I've written before. And this is when I realized that being myself just, you know, is very important. And I think that article was probably instrumental to shaping me as a writer. Just this, you know, and, I, and, the, and the, so point number one, in life, we have these little moments. And that was a little moment. I call it a TiVo moment. But we need to pay attention to that. Okay. And luckily, I did. And that changed the way I write. And but I still continue to write about investing, and um, I would yeah I would write yeah, about investing, and uh, and my articles would be published in Financial Times, you know, Institutional Investor, and I would send them to my friends, and when I was sending to my friends, I would also write something about uh, my personal life, and then as my as my email list grew, as my you know email subscribers you know, email subscribers grew. It wasn't just my friends who were receiving my articles, you know, and uh, my you know, my personal notes, and people would start to tell me that they came to to me for the articles, for the investment articles, but they stayed for the personal stories. And what changed with me is this: I writing basically forces you to think a lot more. Because it's it's almost like a, it's a focused thinking. Think about it. I wake up every day at five o'clock for thirty five o'clock, and I write for two hours. That is a two hours of concentrated thinking. And most of us don't like a lot of people don't have that luxury, and therefore they just don't get to spend much time thinking about things. So that you know that basically turned me into a thinker, and. Uh, you know, and therefore, and over time, I started to write about, you know, and I also love classical music, and you and I share interest in music. And uh, what I learned is this: if I write about this, this is my, this is, this gives me an opportunity to learn more. And also, and this is another thing to understand: you write daily, part of you becomes like you, you become a writer. Okay, so I always, I kind of, when somebody says, what do you do for a living? If I don't want to tell them, talk about stock market, I tell them I'm a writer. But I'm not, you know, but my, day, my daily job is not a writer. I'm an investor, right? However, since I write daily, part of me is a writer. And why it's important? Because as a writer, you always look for stories. As a writer, you look at life differently. So my father paints, and you, all, you, know, and I, you can see the paintings behind me. Those are my father's paintings. Um, and whenever my, we would travel on vacation, my father would always kind of put his hands up like this and always look for something to paint. This is what he, you know, this is what painters do. They look for what they want to paint. As a writer, you always look for stories. So writing, you know, so I wrote about, you know, first about investing, then about life, then about classical music. And when I started to write more about classical music, they changed what I read. You know, now I've started to read more about classical music. So to, to answer your very short question, how did I become a kind of a student of life, basically? I think writing basically turned me into what I am today. Let me ask you a tactical question about that. So you mentioned you write for two hours a day. 
Is there a hard stop at that two hours? Meaning if you're on a roll and you're like really cranking and you have this idea you want to get out, are you uh, disciplined enough to say, oh, two hours are up, go save some more for tomorrow? All right. Uh, let's get into inside baseball a little bit. Okay. So there are two type of writers. Okay. There are two philosophies when it comes to writing. There are professional writers who, I don't know, like who basically says, I'm going to write 1500 words a day. Okay that those are people who Michael Kreis and John Grisham and others who basically would, you know, would write a novel or two a year, right? Um, I look at writing a little bit different. I basically, it's creates, I create a space, two hours, and from five to seven, I write. And that's a space that basically where I show up and I have no idea if the muse or my subconscious will show up as well and what I'll produce. And uh, so a lot of times I would show up and I would sit, I would sit and I'd stare at the computer and produce nothing or com- produce complete junk. And what's important is that I stopped in the beginning, I would get upset that I, my wife would say, how much did you write today? And I would say, eh, a paragraph. She said, so you spent two, two hours in the basement or and you, that's, what, that's what you did. And at first it kind of, I was, I was kind of upset at myself for how ineffective I was. But then I realized that actually when I leave my chair, like, you know, you know, I wrote for two hours, even though I have nothing to show for this, I implanted seeds in my subconscious. And then while I'm taking a shower, going for a walk, this is where ideas will come. And next, next morning when I show up, I'm going to have something to say. So most of the time I'm constrained because by seven o'clock, because I have to drive my kids to school. In the summertime, when I don't have to drive my, to sc- my, my kids to school, if, I, if, if it's just, if, if the letters, you know, if, if the sense is just flowing, I may stay later. But a lot of times I just have to, you know, kind of life comes in and, you know, as I, I have three kids and my youngest one is eight years old and my oldest one is 21. And the day, I still remember the days when I was driving my 20 year old who is now 21 to, you know, to school. And, and now he doesn't need me to drive him to school anymore, right? And so therefore, when I drive my eight-year-old to school, I realized that I only have another nine years or eight, or eight, nine, eight or nine years. So when I drive her to school, I try to be present and I look at it as a, such a huge privilege that I get to drive my daughter to school. And so this is why, so I don't look at seven o'clock as, oh, I have to drive my, my daughter to school and therefore I can't try it. Actually, I look at it as a, as a good thing. I look at it as a, I get to spend, you know, uh, the 20 minutes in the car with my nature. Reframing. Well, we're going to talk about that as well. So the moment, the reason I asked about the two hours was, uh, I remember I heard Seinfeld talking about his process and he, he had a hard stop and he said, it's because what you highlighted earlier, that it's hard work. Like I've been wanting to put a journaling process in the morning that I just can't because I'm like, oh, I, I, too, you know, it sounds like too much work. It is hard work. So he, he kind of compared it to going to see a trainer and saying, you know, how long is the session and the trainer being like, it's undefined, you know, <laughs> like you have to, you know, he's like, no, you have to have a 30 minute, you know, time limit on it to, to get point. through it. So I'm just kind of curious at how you uh, developed that. So it's really interesting that you, you brought it up uh, with this, you almost have this like positive thing to look forward to at the end of it, which is interesting. Writing is not always fun. It's a lot of times it's treacherous. This is, I think uh, Jerry is absolutely right. Having the defined two hours is very important because I know it's a commitment on, you know, and I, and I, and I, and Seinfeld has another trick where he, you know, he tries to not to break a streak. So he shows up every, you know, he wants to write a joke every day. So I write with, you know, with few exceptions every single day. Like when I go on vacation and I travel, things get complicated. But when I'm in Denver, I write every single day without exception, even yeah, on I Saturday think, and Sunday. Yeah. I think Seinfeld, like, X's out calendar squares on his wall. So he actually visually sees the breaks in his system. It's just, just so interesting. And this, this applies to so many things. We're going to talk a little bit about having a process and, and systematizing things for investing. And it just, it's funny to see the synergies across multiple mm-hmm. uh, interests. So that's a good habit to develop. And I want to talk about good and bad habits. So if anyone is familiar with coding, you understand that an algorithm, for example, is just essentially, if this, then 
Yes. And we can use this framework for developing good and bad habits. So I'm kind of curious for you, what are some examples where you've used if this then to either enforce a good habit or even you know replace a bad habit? I give you two for, two for the price of one. So this is a, it's not in the book. So this is going to be interesting. So I found that I drink a lot of coffee and I like coffee and I drink it. I don't think I'm drinking it because of the, I just, as silly as it sounds, I like the taste, you know, and I, so I, I, at some point I found that I drink literally, you know, maybe six, seven cups a day, which is too much. So I created this, if this, then habit. So for every cup of coffee, I do 30, 30 push-ups. So I like, so literally, so if I'm at the office or at home, before I can have a sip of coffee for every cup, I do 30 push-ups. So the number of cups declined to two or three, and I do now 60 to 90 push-ups a day. So I linked, so it's a, think about this, the bad habit declined, and I also, you know, and I'm also, you know, doing extra exercises. Um, so, but, you know, but the, um, James Clear, this wrote this phenomenal book, Atomic Habits. And he basically says, when you're trying to create a habit, the whole idea is that you want to make it as easy as possible to create this habit. So if you want to run in the morning, put your running shoes so it's easy to see them and, and prepare your running clothes so it's easy to see them, you know, you know to, uh, to see them. Like for us, the issue was like, you know, I live in Denver. So, you know, we go skiing in the wintertime. And the, and the, the issue with skiing is actually you, we have to recreate a habit every single year because we don't ski. We only ski four, four months a year, right? So for eight months, I don't ski. So that habit gets interrupted. So what we did with kids we actually have ski bags that are packed the night before. And the, all, the, all, all the boots are there and all our ski clothes are prepared. So when we wake up in the morning, we don't have to put a lot of effort to go skiing because we still have to drive for two hours to go skiing. So just those little things will help you to kind of, and then once you, you know, the, the first day of the season is the diff- most difficult one. The third one is much easier. So, um, and, uh, so when you try to create a habit, uh, don't focus on quality, uh, 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 so in other words, don't focus, like, let's, let's come back to your writing. Okay. Don't focus on how well you write. Don't even all focus on how long you write, focus on showing up and start with five minutes. And for five minutes, all you do is write. Okay, and then and do this for 20 days and then raise it up to 20 minutes. And just, you know, the whole idea of creating habits is just persistency. And consistency, persistency. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Yeah. To, your, to your coffee point, I, I want to stick on that. I, I don't know what this has to do with investing, but I, I just want to touch on it basically. So I love coffee like you love coffee. I, I, I only drink one big cup in the morning usually, but it's almost ceremonial. It just feels like mm. there's something about it that just feels like ceremony is the, is the word that comes to mind. And, and you mentioned this in the book, that this, the importance of tradition of ceremony. And you, you mentioned a couple of you know, Jewish traditions that you've incorporated with your kids, even though you didn't really grow up being very yeah. religious. Yeah. I'm curious what your, your opinion in general is on things like tradition and ceremony and how important that is to sprinkle those out throughout your life. So Nassim Talib says, traditions are the melody of life. And I love that. I love that. Um, well, yeah, so the kind of Jews are big in traditions. You know, you don't have to be religious Jews too. You know, it's just they're big in traditions. You know, so the, whenever I try to get my kids to do something, especially when they're young, they may, may not necessarily want to do, I always try to tie it to something positive. So I'll give an example. So for the last 10 or 12 years, we've been going to Santa Fe every year. And so it's, it's Santa Fe is about 300 miles away from here. It's an eight, eight, eight hour ride. And when I take them there, we go to the opera. My kids are absolutely normal kids. So they love opera as much as the, you know, as the normal kid would. But when we go there, uh, on the way there, we stop by Dairy Queen. When we go there, we go, you know, you know we go to restaurants and allow, allow them to buy sweets. When we went to the opera, I allowed my son to buy Sprite, which we rarely allow kids to buy, you know, come drinks. So actually that was in the beginning. Now, when we go there to Santa Fe, 
I don't even have to bribe them anymore because this was be, this became something we do. And it's, it's kind of funny. I was talking to my son about this, and I asked him, like, and I was telling him that you know, like, I was suggesting somebody to go to Santa Fe. And he said, why would they want to go to Santa Fe? I said, well, what do you mean we go every year? He said, well, but that's our tradition. That's why we go. Uh, so uh, I think tra- traditions give you kind of this uh, special when you try to, try, try to raise kids. These, they give you this comfort. They give you this kind of safety. You know, the kids feel... Um, now when we go to Santa Fe and we walk on the street or something... My kids say, remember this, when we did this, uh, you know, and so, uh, so traditions are basically, I think they add another consistency to your life and also create uh, memories. I mean, I guess that's, you know, that's what uh, traditions helped us to do. Touching on that consistency or persistency of showing up to write every day, it reminds me of uh, actually one of my favorite poems of all time. It's by Charles Bukowski. It's called Between Races. And this, the poem, it basically goes through this where he's at the races, the track race, the horse races where he's just every day, basically. And a guy comes up and wants to interview him. And, and he just says, no, 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 I don't do interviews. I don't want to do it. And then the guy finally breaks down. And he says, look, it's not really an interview. I just like want to know how to be, you know, what it takes to write. And I love this answer. I have it right here. He says, basically, talking to the young man made me feel bad. They thought that writing had something to do with the politics of the thing. They were simply not crazy enough in the head to sit down to a typer and let the words bang out. They didn't want to write. They wanted to succeed at writing. And that that line actually changed my life because it was basically this idea of like, you know, at the time I was a touring musician, as you mentioned, and I came to the realization that to be successful in that endeavor, you had to travel constantly. You had to, the hours you had off, you had to practice scales on your instrument or whatever, all these things that I didn't particularly love doing. So it, I, while I wanted to be successful in that career, I didn't want to just sit down there and bang at the typewriter. So when, I, when you talk about the persistency of, a, of being a writer, is that something that can be learned? Meaning like it just, it, it just takes showing up every day and doing it and eventually you become a good writer. Or do you have to have something in you that's crazy enough to sit down at the typer every day and get better at it? Hey everybody, Trey Lockerbie here from We Study Billionaires. And I wanted to tell you about a new company that I absolutely love and that is called Trade. Trade combines two of my favorite things, coffee and technology. So what you do is you go to drinktrade.com. There's a super simple survey that you take, and then it tells you which coffee they're going to send you that you are literally guaranteed to love. Meaning if you don't love it, they'll send you a new bag of coffee for free. And from there, you can keep experimenting so you're not falling into the same rut of drinking the same coffee over and over and over again. There are so many different types of roasters, levels of roast, beans from different parts of the world. There's plenty to nerd out on here. So why not be adventurous and try some new stuff? After I took the quiz, they sent me a bag from Sight Glass Coffee in Northern California, and it's literally my favorite coffee of all time. Normally, I've been drinking a coffee where I have to sweeten it with honey and almond milk, but this coffee, I could actually drink it black. It was so delicious just on its own. And right now, Trade is offering subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking the quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find the perfect coffee for you. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off. That is a, such a great question. Um, I'll give you a couple answers because I'm, I'm just thinking about speaking. Uh, so number one, the Epictetus uh, has the saying, if you want to be a writer, write. Okay, so showing up is very, very important. Okay, a lot of times we think that as a muse, like waiting for the muse. Okay, in other words, we think when when the muse comes to me, when inspiration comes, then I'll write. Well, that's not how it works. You show up and then you try to write, and then inspiration comes. The act of showing up is that that's what creates inspiration. Uh, But then another answer is, like, I don't like working out. I really don't. Like, I let me tell you how much I don't like working out. I have a trainer. Let's just think how ridiculous this sounds. I pay a guy, show up twice a week, and he basically tells me, directs me what to do. Okay? And, like, I'm an intelligent person, and I maybe, maybe I needed him for the first 
five ex- five yeah, five lessons. Okay, but the fact that I have an appointment twice a week, that it's on my it's my it's on my calendar, as any other appointment, which I never break, if, unless I'm traveling. That really how much I hate. That's how much I hate working out. But he's there, and and because he's there, I, that's why I keep this appointment. And the only reason I'm doing this because I know as I get older, if I want to stay healthy, I need to work out. Now, the happiness in life comes from having good problems. If you liked to be the musician, but you didn't want to have the problems that come with being musicians, musician, then that really, you, you would have liked to be a musician without really doing all the suffering that it takes. So I really love writing, okay? I don't love it every day, you know, and uh, some days I love it more than others. But I, I'm willing to suffer, you know, for writing. I, I love music and I would like to play piano, for instance, but I'm not willing. And actually I tried and I failed miserably. More importantly, I was not willing to suffer, you know, to play piano. So happiness in life comes from having good problems. So you really have to be passionate about something, you know, then, then it's going to become a good problem. That's, you know, that's, yeah. I don't know if it's a very long winded answer, but that's, that's all I got. So talking about suffering a little bit, that might be a good segue to lead into stoicism in in a sense, because that is sort of the idea of reframing suffering to a degree. I actually had this idea reading your book. I was thinking, um, stoicism is kind of like downside protection. (laughs) If you compare it to investing, right? You're kind of just trying to eliminate the downside protection. So there's an entire section in the book dedicated to stoicism. So walk us through your discovery of stoicism and why you're so drawn to the philosophy. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. I've been, you know, I've been reading a lot of, been stumbling on a lot of quotes by Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, and they always sounded very, very smart. And then I read this book called The Art of Good Life by uh, William Irvin. And by the way, it's a phenomenal book. And if you guys, if you pick up this book and you're new to Stoicism, skip the first three chapters because it's a you know it's a it's a lot about it's a, it's about uh, history of different philosophies, and go to chapter four I think this is where he starts talking about Stoic philosophy. You can come back to the first three chapters later, but if you start with chapter four, I think it's going to make sure that you can you're going to complete the book. Um, but what really got uh, got me into Stoicism is one quote by Epictetus, and which sounds so banal and so plain. But it was an aha moment for me. And the quote is very simple. It says, some things are up to us, they're internal. Some things are not up to us, they're external. And that is such a simple quote. And I'm, I'm shrinking the quote a little bit. But if you look at your life and realize that you have so little control what's internal to you, you know, basically you have control about what you think, and what you think, um, how you look at the situation, and you have very little control about anything else. You go into the uh, airport to rent a car, and the car is not available. That's external. That's not up to you. You take in a test. You, the only thing you have control over is uh, how much, how you prepare for the test. You had to control how you showed up every day and studied for this test. But once you took the test. But even when you're taking the test, there are so many random factors. If, if you calculate, I, I'm, I'm just, when, I'm, when I visualize the test, I think about my CFA exam, where I brought two calculators you know, uh, to the exam, because what if the battery died in one? Um, so, but, they, you know, but while I was taking the test, there were so many things that I could not control. If the AC was working, if how well I slept last night, all the different things. So that was external to me. When somebody is rude to me, it's external to me. Now, this is very important. Even what I just said, somebody is rude to me. That's, an, that's my interpretation. Okay, this is another part of Stoic philosophy. Um, I can look at what they said and I can perceive it as rude and therefore it's going to impact me. Or I can basically look at what they said 
and not phrase it as rude, but basically say just being different to what they said. And therefore, as you kind of mentioned, Stoic philosophy allows you to kind of reduce the downside volatility. Um, so, like you know, so I reframed what the person said as basically uh, kind of be neutral, you know, not, and you know, and not taking it personally, you know, this, you know, whoever is rude to you, whatever, but if having a bad day or whatever, you don't know what's happening in the person's life. Therefore, if you take it, if you if you take it as rude and that upsets you, you allowed yourself to be upset. That's internal again. See, what they do is external. How you perceive it is internal to you. This is where you talk about reframing. That's what reframing comes in, right? You basically look what happens to you, and then you reframe it in a way that it doesn't hurt you. Yeah, there's this uh, quote actually by Mike Tyson I came across once where he basically said, "I once used to get mad at people until I figured out that if they if I get mad at them, then they own me." And I just thought that was like so encompassing of of this philosophy in particular. Yeah, I think the I forget one of the either uh, Seneca or Epictetus said or something along the lines that you would not allow a person to come to a house and trash it, but by reacting what the person says, you basically allow them to get into your mind and do whatever they want in your mind, right? So that's you know that's the same concept. Yes, you kind of mentioned this idea of with externals or in, and internals. Um, you, you referenced the Buffett quote about a, you know, a scorecard. I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with that. But I, I also came across this quote uh, recently. I just ho- overheard someone say it. They're like, you just have, you have to control the controllables. And I just thought that was like almost bumper sticker-esque, yeah. you know? but uh, sim- simple enough for me to remember it. And I, I thought that was really cool. You, know, you do touch on Seneca. And, and I, I came across Seneca really in my, my early 20s, I, I think during my like search for enlightenment that I think a lot of young guys <laughs> have that uh, certain experience uh, in your early 20s. And I, I've kind of come to think that the word enlightenment uh, can be defined by this, this idea, which is essentially, you can't believe everything you think. So you, you almost have to get this out of body, uh, look at yourself and your thoughts and analyze them objectively. And, you know, everyone experiences imposter syndrome, for example, and, and, maybe artists more than others. Yeah. Uh, how does learning about a, an artist's life, as you've, you've di- dissected multiple artists in the book, how does it uh, help you manage your own imposter syndrome and, and not believe everything you think? Oh my God, there are so many things. There are so many ways I can, and I can answer this question. I think one of the most important things I did, is to, uh, I, I meditate. I, I have on and off moments, but I mostly meditate. So I, I should say, it's not I meditate, I mostly meditate. And meditation, people usually misunderstand what it does. You know, meditation, they think it's a kind of, it calms you down, so then it does that. But one, there's one, this very important benefit of meditation, it allows you to look at yourself as an out, like uh, at your thoughts as an outside observer. So in other words, when a thought comes to you, you actually be able to kind of look outside the thought and observe that this, you know, you know, that uh, that you have this thought. The reason it's important because that gives you self awareness and mindfulness. Because a lot of times we go through life kind of mindless. We we have this conversation in our head all the time, and we're not even aware of this because it's been there all our life, right? But once you start noticing this conversation, first of all, it allows you to get rid of negative emotions because a lot of the conversation is negative. By observing that you have a negative thought, it actually neutralizes that. But uh, let's talk about uh, what we can learn from other creators. Well, number one, every like we look at, you know, I write about Tchaikovsky, for instance, right? We listen to Tchaikovsky's music today, you know, and we hear this absolutely unbelievable music. And we don't think about how much struggle and effort Tchaikovsky went to write this music, okay? And um, every, every creative person, you know, struggles to become good or to, crea- or to create something that's worth listening to or worth looking at. And in the beginning, they were not good. And they kept doing it and kept failing, getting better and better and better. And um, the, the, you mentioned the imposter syndrome. Just let me, just let me, 
paint this picture to you. Just, I started to write for the street.com in 2004. And I was 31 years old. Okay. And a year later, I, you know, after being you know, writing for the street.com for a year, I decided I want to write for Financial Times. Just it's like, it's like going from my minor leagues to it's like it's going to high school baseball to uh, to playing for Yankees. So luckily, I had so little self awareness at the time that because I like you know because I did not deserve to write for Financial Times, but I behaved as as if if as if I did. And after reading a few articles, that gave me confidence to keep doing this. So the imposter syndrome is basically is is the difference from where we are today, where we think we are today. Uh, there was a saying, "Fake until you fake it till you make it," and it's not really about deceiving others; it's about deceiving yourself. It's actually creating self confidence for yourself to to doing what you think you don't deserve to be doing. Uh, so. Uh, you know, and think about just to make things even more interesting. I wrote my first book, Active Value Investing. I started working on it in 2005. Again, like maybe three or four months after I started writing for Financial Times. Um, again, like I'm looking backwards and I'm so thankful that I was clueless. Uh, because today, I would not, you know, today, probably more self aware person of myself. Uh, probably would not be able to do this, you know. Uh, anyway, well, you, I want to stick on that topic of deceiving yourself because when you when you think about stoicism, often people just think that oh, these are like emotionless people that uh, you know have something, some maybe neurological difference in their brain, and they just can't feel emotions. And that's maybe what makes them a great investor, for example, because you have to weather all of these different environments where things might be going against you, and that. Well, the way you describe it in, in the in the book is is really this uh, this beautiful way of of reframing it as as we've talked about. So you need a little bit of stoicism to weather these different environments, but you can potentially overdo it. So what I'm talking about is essentially say we saw a lot of Warren Buffett on the show, for example, yeah. and you mentioned the snowball in the book and how they how he's described and and that to some degree feels like stoicism at its absolute. Uh, maximum or the the farthest end of the spectrum. Why would investors, maybe for for this on this topic in particular, not want to be Warren Buffett? Okay, so two answers. Number one, just because a thought entered your mind doesn't mean it's the right thought. Okay, so framing it the right way is extremely important. Okay, so here's an example: when the stock price declines thirty percent, you can frame it differently. You can frame it as, oh my God, my portfolio over the stock price declined by 30%. Or you can look at it as that at this point in time, it's, it's an opinion that took it down 30%. So the, so the question you should ask, you should really ask yourself, what is the fair value of the company? What is, you know, so the, the stock is down 30%, so what? That, that's an opinion, that's what change. It's the value, you know, has anything changed? You know, what the question should be asking, has anything happened to companies' earnings, cash flows? You know, has the value changed? So that's point number one. Another thing about Warren Buffett, um, when I read Snowball, um, which is a great book about Warren Buffett, what I really, like I, I read it when my, my kids were still very young. And I'm so lucky that I did, because what I saw what, what I saw there is the Buffett I don't want to become, because one Buffett basically had a, such a great dedication to investing that it took over his whole life, his whole personal life. He's you know he spent very little time with his kids. He neglected his wife, and I'm not judging it. I'm just that was the interpretation. That that's what I learned from the book. Because you can look at somebody, you know, you can look at the, somebody could be, nobody's perfect. There was Warren Buffett had a, such a great positive impact on me as a hero, but this part of his life, he was my kind of anti-hero. Okay. And what I realized that I may be able to be more successful than Buffett, you know, because I'm going to have a better relationship with my kids. I'm going to spend more time with them. And that was a that that book was probably one of the most important books I read in my life. You know, at that point in time, because I actually realized that time is fleeing, and if I and I need to make 
So what happens to investors, not just by to everybody, like investing is almost like a drug. And you, if you, if you have a passion and you love doing this, like if you don't put the rail, kind of guardrails, you, I'll be spending 24 hours a day doing invested. And by doing this, I will neglect people I love, my kids, my wife, you know, my relatives. So I always have in the back, on the back of my mind that my kids will not be young forever. And that if I, you know, if I don't spend time with them now, when I wake up, they'll be much older. They'll be different people. I, I can't go back and redo it. Because again, my kids, they'll grow up. And I, it's kind of interesting. I look at the videos of my, of my daughter, when, you know, like my middle daughter when she was six or eight years old. And part of me vaguely remembers her being that age because, you know, they grow up slowly. And, uh, and then you remember them when they were now, maybe a year ago. But I, but I also have a good feeling that they know that I've spent time with them. My, you know, and, uh, that, and that's very important to me. It's very important for my kids. Um, so I, I wrote about it. I wrote on the subject before, even before the book. And my son knew about this. Uh, and um, when he was going to college, uh, was, you know, when he was going to college, um, um, he, no, he was, uh, um, was going to go on a trip to Israel in his gap year. And uh, before, we, you know, before he left for Israel, he wanted us to exchange notes. You know, uh, us, you know, he would he write us a note and we would write him a note and we would read it after you know, he gets on a plane. And uh, I remember the note he wrote to me and he said um, that I was always, after I read Buffett's book, I was always concerned that I'm not spending enough time with him. And he said, Dad, don't worry. You've been a great father and you always spend enough time with me. I, always, I, I never felt neglected by you. That was probably the most important note I've got in my life. Um, but so that's, that's, what I, you know, that's what I learned uh, from Snowball, I guess, yeah. You touched on Buffett and his craft, right? He's sitting at his office studying, investing, like focused on his craft. And that is like very admirable to your point. And even though we might be able to overdo it, there's a lot in your book about sort of art meets craft, you know, having soul in the game. All these things kind of calculate to having a meaningful life. You, you mentioned Euro from the sushi restaurant in Japan, <laughs> spending 80 plus years perfecting sushi. And I, I've seen the documentary actually, and I, there's a part where they, you know, the understudies have to make rice for like 20 years before he lets them like do anything else. It, it's that extreme. And I'm kind of curious that while there's a lot of things to admire about someone who is so uh, focused on their craft, those guardrails you mentioned, I'm kind of curious if, um, how you go about implementing those so that you that you know where the boundaries are, where you're focusing enough time here or there? So a couple of things. Um, I drive my kids to school most of the time. So that's one, the starts in the morning. Um, I pick them up from school, not all the time, but a lot of times. Uh, we go for a walk, we go skiing. Um, uh, then there's a, there's a saying that attention is a currency of time. So being in your room with kids, being in the same room with kids, is not necessarily mean, does, doesn't necessarily mean that you are being with your kids. You've just been physically there, not mentally. By focusing and spending time with them, talking to them, that's how, that's, the, that's what the attention is, you know. And, um, you know, and I'm not, you know, and by the way, just the last thing I, the last thing I want to do is to create an image that I'm a perfect parent. I'm not. I'm, I'm struggling through parenting life like everybody else. Um, but I am constantly thinking, am I spending enough time with my kids? And when I feel that uh, the work takes over my, you know, it takes over my life and it just kind of pushes out everything else, I stop. And I have a luxury of kind of the irony of this. I have a luxury of working as much as little as I work, you know, as I want because I run the firm, so I can, you know, create my own schedule. But a lot of times, I find I still work more than everybody else here. I consciously make a decision to spend time with my kids, and uh, it's just something. It's like a muscle you train. It's just something that you have to be aware of this because if you're mindless about it, like especially you know, listeners to this podcast. Because, you know, like if you're passionate about investing, it just kind of takes over your life. 
And so I, I constantly remind myself that they won't be young forever. You know, that's actually the exact reason I, I switched careers away from music to, to be present. For, I read the same book. That this had the exact same impact on me, actually, um, in the same way. And now I am a father, and, and you're a father. And parenting, uh, you write a lot about in the book. And, and I want to go to your father, who, who you seem to have a high regard for. And he was also a very accomplished painter, so much so that you, you actually uh, feature his work in the book. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I want to know a little bit what you've learned from his craft and his creative process and what you've taken away from seeing him work that you either apply to your investing or to your writing. So I think I, I'm not sure how much I learned from him as a painter, but what I learned from my th- father is this constant curiosity to learn. It's kind of like my, the, there was another title that was competing for the book. You know, the, it's called Soul in a Game. Originally, I was going to name it student of life. And that's because to me, that is such an important concept. When you are a student of life, then you are open to, to learning all the time. Uh, I'll give an example. Um, if you play chess and you lose, you can get upset about it, or you can reframe it as, again, coming back to reframing, as that the part of learning is losing. Okay. And uh, so my father, when he was, he painted since he was seven years old and he was, he's an incredibly accomplished painter, artist. Um, When he was 60 something years old, he discovered that in Denver, there's this uh, very accomplished, terrific artist. His name is Kim English, who did this wonderful pastels. My father, 60, I don't know, maybe 65 years old, this very accomplished artist enrolls in the master class of Kim English to learn about uh, pastels. He had zero ego, you know, because he, you know, he finds, he finds joy in learning. And um, that is probably the most important thing I learned from my father is that just constantly be learning. By the way, um, in investing, let's come back to investing. If you feel that you, f- you finally arrived and you learned and you know everything, you're so dangerous because your ego right now, you basically, your ego is, is uh, you have this God complex and your ego is, makes you very, very dangerous. That means you're going to lose a lot of money at some point. If you are constantly willing, if you are a student of life and you're constantly willing to learn and change your mind, because being a student of life allows you also to change your mind because you're still learning. Um, that is incredibly important. Uh, so anyway, so this, you know, what I learned from my father is kind of being a student of life. So that kind of takes me to the, the next part of the book, which is around classical composers. So you actually are a big fan of classical music. And I really enjoyed this part of the book, particularly probably for obvious reasons, but I've never been a classical music fan. I mean, I appreciate it, but I wouldn't say it's like what I go to to listen to, mainly because as you, you put in the book, it quote unquote takes work, much like writing as we talked about earlier. But what are some of, of reasons our listeners should invest in learning about classical music and p- specifically the composers behind the work? Well, I think first of all, they should listen to classical music because it's so beautiful. Um, I have this website, uh, myfavoriteclassical.com, where I actually share my, my favorite uh, cl- uh, classical music clips and writings about classical music. And I think there's a, if they search the website, I think uh, I created a play- playlist, uh, I call it Gateway Drug to Classical Music. So that I just, I found the recording, like the pieces that they are the most easiest, to, they require the least amount of work for you to listen to and to fall in love with classical music. So I think the reason you want to read about them, because like, as I mentioned, Tchaikovsky, uh, creative process, just anything creative comes with its own sense of difficulties. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories. Um, so in, uh, eight, in early 1800s, in I think 18, I forget the years, 1815, 1820, forget the year, Beethoven was the biggest composer of the West, like bigger than any other composer. And in fact, when he wrote his ninth symphony, somebody said, this is the day the music died because you can't write anything better than this. This is the top of music. So 
And Beethoven had a very interesting impact on other composers. I would argue that he actually set back, you know, set music back many years because he, everybody looked at him, every, you know, there were so many composers in his shadows that a lot of them stopped composing. Other ones composed, but never published it. Uh, like there was, a, there was a composer that lived in Vienna, uh, probably not that far away from Beethoven at the time, Franz Schubert. And he wrote 6,000 pieces of music throughout his life. And he, young, he died when he, when he was very young, I think in his early 30s. And most of it will never get published because he was in a Beethoven shadow. Uh, because he was like, how could I possibly publish this when I just heard you know, Beethoven's Seventh Symphony? And the irony of this, today we listen to Schubert and in Beethoven at the same time, and we don't say this one is, you know, Beethoven is better than Schubert. They're, they're both beautiful, just differently. You know, you know it's, music is a, it's a, it's not math. You know, it's a, some people love Beethoven. Actually, I lo- personally, I like Schubert's music more than I like Beethoven's music. You know, that's just me. That's me personally. So uh, let's apply this to investing. Who is the Beethoven of investing? Warren Buffett. Like, I'll give you an example. So for a long time, Buffett's, remember Buffett used to say that he doesn't invest in technology stocks because he doesn't understand technology. I remember so many value investors who said, I don't buy technology because I don't understand technology. Well, Buffett is, was at the time was 85 years old and they were 25 years old. You know, maybe they should understand technology. So what Buffett was saying, technology was, what they should have learned from Buffett is that technology was outside of his circle of competence. That's why he did not invest it. That's the lesson they should have taken out, is that that's, that, but that's Buffett's circle of competence. When you're 25 years old, your circle of competence is different. So therefore, maybe you should have, you know, maybe you should have invested in technology because it's easier for you to understand it for than for 85 year old. Um, let me give you another example. Um, there was this another uh, a composer Berlioz, who wrote, uh, who never got classical training in as a composer. He started, you know, studying music when he was 12 or 13 years old, and because he did not know. The, you know, the classical rules of how to compose music. He, uh, like Picasso has a saying, uh, you learn the rules so you can break them. Well, he never learned the rules. So when he was breaking them, it was much easier for him. So a lot of times, a lot of times we get exposed to dogma of, and that actually um, reduces our creativity. And it's, um, and a lot of, there is some value in, arriving to your knowledge through first principles perspective, not adopting somebody else's uh, beliefs. Um, so uh, there is a terrific investor uh, in Switzerland, uh, uh, Robert uh, uh, Vinyl. And, uh, and I, we had a dinner with him and I told him, he, you know, because Rob, Rob never got a classical, uh, classical education value investing. So I told him, you're like Berlioz. Uh, uh, <laughs> you did not know the rules we were breaking when you started investing. So another thing you can learn from, you know, from uh, classical music composers, like you know, if you're a creative person, is that, as I was mentioned, that to create anything worth listening or watching or hearing uh, you need to. It's it's a it's a painful pro- and, uh, creativity. By definition, is a, is is a, is a uh, to cre- to do this. You need to go through a certain amount of suffering, because creativity, you know, uh, cr- uh, suffering is almost like uh, is a part of anything creative. When you work in a construction site and you are there with a stop sign, you know, when it's stop and go, that there is very little creativity in this. Very little suffering. Okay. When you when when you when you write in the book, when you write in an article, when you write music, that process is never linear and never pain free. And all the all, all those composers went went through their own version of suffering to create this you know to create this music, and um, and as investors, and this is I guess you know this how I can bring it to investing, you cannot be in a stock market and not expect that you're gonna have positive years all the time that you're going to go through investing uh, 
without achieving any, you know, kind of experience any kind of pain. And that's, you should be, uh, that is a good problem. Like if you love investing, that is part of the course. That's, you know, that you, there'll be time when you'll be very upset where you'll be making, and I, by the way, in the chapter, there's a book, uh, there's in the book, there's a chapter called Pain, Upper and Investing, where I discuss basically a very period, a very painful period of, of 2015, you know, and as, as an investor. And I wrote this in 2016. Uh, I wrote this chapter in 2016, and I, and it was so painful and it was so embarrassing at the time for me that I just wrote it and never published it. And I finally, you know, uh, six year late, six or seven years later, it was easier for me to publish it in a book. And I think that chapter, if you are, um, as you and I talk, and the like, you know, a lot of Nasdaq stocks are down a bunch. And I have a lot of friends who are terrific investors who are struggling right now. And I would really encourage them to read this chapter because I think, you know, I try to bring, like, uh, explain what I went through and how you could apply Stoic philosophy to this experience and how it could actually reduce your pain. Uh, anyway, so I'm very low on answer to your question. What? What you just said kind of reminded me of this quote. It's attributed to William Faulkner a lot. I think it's older, actually, but it's this idea of killing your darlings. It's sort of a lit- uh, literary term um, where, and I'm, I'm curious to know if you've experienced this as a writer, because what you were saying about Buffett not understanding technology, well, he then went on to buy Apple. It was like one of the greatest trades of all time. <laughs> and so, you know, this is someone killing their darling, so to speak. So something that was pre- this, this idea that's precious to them, ultimately breaking that rule. It's, it, it's kind of aligned with, you know, strong opinions loosely held or something, if you will, just yeah. expanding your learning, um, things that you hold precious, uh, just understanding when it makes sense to uh, disregard that. And, and I'm kind of curious if this ties into a, another point you were making where, uh, the best I can describe it is I was at the Van Gogh Museum uh, in Amsterdam once, and you see his early works of landscapes, and they're like some of the most incredible landscape paintings you've ever seen. And and this they're like kind of by the book in a way, like they're very like I think technique wise, like I'm, I'm not an artist, so I can't speak like you can, but they're just unbelievable. And then you go look at his later work, and it looks nothing remotely like it. It's sort of like he learned the rules and then decided to break them. He sort of killed his darlings, if you will. Do you, do you feel like this is a, uh, a theme that can be applied to investing in the same way? Um, well, first of all, that Van Gogh Museum is my favorite museum in the world. I've been there, I think, two or three times, and I, I absolutely love that museum. Um, and you are right. When I, I think Jim O'Shaughnessy and I kind of uh, discussed this on Twitter about this. You see it, Van Gogh's early paintings, and they're absolutely phenomenal. They're very traditional. But you know, but they're phenomenal. Now, they if that's all he ever painted, we probably would never know about him, right? Because they are not they are very very good, but they are very similar to everybody uh, to everybody else. And through iteration and discovery, you know, kind of Van Gogh probably discovered his style. That's when you see Van Gogh painting today, you know it's Van Gogh, right? You know, the, the, his later paintings. Um, like, I think the mistake people make is that when we look at other people, we should learn not what they think, but how they think. See, in a sense, like when, like I gave you, like when you talk about Apple, right? We should learn from Buffett, not that you should not buy technology, not what he thinks, but how he thinks. And I'm not well. Then I'm not going to buy technology because at this point in time, it's outside of my core competence. But Buffett had uh, there is this um, terrific uh, writer Ben Thompson who writes strategy, and and I read him daily. And what Ben has this unique ability to go back and criticize himself all the time, where he says, "I wrote this. I was wrong. Here's why." Because that is the only way to learn. It's a great, uh, I think it's a Kahneman quote where he said something along the lines that it's a great day where I learned something new, what was wrong before, some, some, something along those lines, right? Because there is a Seneca has this quote, which basically sums it up. Time discovers truth. You can apply it to anything. 
and you can apply it to investing. Because think about it, as an investors, we want to discover what the company is worth before time discovers it, right? Therefore, it's not about us trying to reinforce our ego that I'm always right and I never make you know, mistakes. It's really just, it's, a, it's really, investing is really kind of a quest for truth. In that quest, you want to, you want to, I guess, you know, have strong ideas loosely held. In other words, if you had a belief and it was wrong, well, you dump that belief and you, you have a new one. So yeah, that's kind of yeah. So that I guess sums up sort of my interpretation of this uh, equation you have in the book, which is essentially the the equation for living a, a meaningful life is essentially art plus soul in the game equals meaningful life. So the art piece for me, what I'm taking away is sort of like, you know, discover your own style and these, use these creative processes to inform different ways to approach both life and, and investing plus soul in the game. So before we, we take off, I want, want to certainly make sure we cover what soul in the game means. What, what, how do you define soul in the game and putting those two together to get to a meaningful life? Yeah. Uh, so, so first of all, we gotta. Um, what is soul? What is game? Right. Well, game is something that um, you're truly passionate about. Something where you, uh, where it's a good problem for you. Okay. Something you're willing to suffer for. Okay. I mean, by the way, it's it's so when I say suffer, it sounds kind of almost like I, I feel like you know Jesus dying on the on the cross. That's not what I mean. It just when you, when you'll be doing you when you'll be doing this, you know that there'll be times that you're gonna love it. There'll be times where it's gonna be difficult and painful, and you are fine going through these painful times. So that's 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 that's, that's the point I want to make there. Um, so what is soul? Soul that is something that is so important and dear to you that um, like it's 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 part of you. Like it's a so when we talk about Jiro, you know the guy who makes sushi. Making sushi was so important for him that he, you know, the, 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 the movie is called uh, Jiro's Dream of Sushi because he thought so much about sushi, how to make the best sushi he can possibly make that he even dreamt about it. Okay. And then, by the way, there's a, there, in the book, I have this concept that I'm very proud of because that's probably the most original thought of the book, this kind of idea, discussion of art and craft. Okay, um, so the story goes like this. My brother and I, my brother, my son John and I were in, um, in, uh, in Venice and we went to Murano factory. And um, there was this guy who was making a horse out of glass. And in the, like you have this kind of, this bulb of glass and he takes this triceps and puts them, you know, puts them into this bulb and suddenly, in a matter of 30 seconds, there is a horse out of nothing, out of glass. And we were so shocked by that. And we were walking on the street and discussing, is it art or craft? And then we realized when we look at the, we look at the, all the stores, they all have this horse. So we, our thinking was, maybe it's a craft, maybe it's not an art. But what I realized, we're looking, we are looking at that the wrong way. And in anything, in any creative activity, in, when you start doing it in the beginning, uh, it's mostly art for you, because the, when you when you repeat something for a long period of time, then it turns into craft. So when this guy was creating a horse and you know for us, because he makes probably fifty of those horses a day, for him it's all craft. There is very little risk in it. He knows exactly how it's going to look when he sits down to make this horse. Um, when he started making in the beginning, for him, the ratio of art and craft was very different. It was mostly art and a little bit of craft. Uh, so in any activity, if we do it long enough, it's, and just we do keep doing the same way, over time, it starts being an art and becomes more and more craft. So it's up to us to change the activity a little bit. So let's apply it to investing. If all you do, just imagine, like this is, uh, I'm going to describe a very pathetic existence. If all you do invest in utility stocks, that's all you do. There's 10, 50, I don't know, 20 companies in the United States, whatever. That's all you do, invest in those companies. And you do it for 20 years, that is going to be all craft, no art. 
Okay. So if you grow your circle of competence over time, then you introduce more and more art to it because there's more uncertainty. There's more things you don't know. Um, and in life, you want to maintain this very nice balance, especially in investing between this, you don't, you, you want to have a circle of competence so you know that you won't make mistakes. But if you stay in this circle of competence all the time, if you don't grow it, it's going to be very, let's say, uh, you're going to be very little craft, uh, very little art left in your life. So again, we keep coming back to Buffett, but Buffett buying Apple was him basically expanding his circle of competence. Coming back to soul in a game. So, so what is soul in a game? Um, I got the idea from Nassim Taleb uh, in his book, Skin in the Game. So let's, you know, he, you know, he talked about skin in the game and soul in the game is the next iteration of that. Skin in the game, basically, if I could put it simply, is that when you associate with people, you want to basically deal with people that not only have upside in your relationship with them, but also have a downside. So in other words, when, um, when somebody invests with IMA, okay, uh, you know, if I only charge him, you know, if you know, if if the only if this relationship is limited to the fact that I just charge charge him fees, I have no skin in the game. The way I get skin in the game is that I own all my liquid net worth is basically invested in the same companies my clients do. So I have skin in the game because if I do research and I buy a company a stock A for them, and I own the same stock, then I experience the same, uh, you know, same downside they do. Again, again my, all my liquid net worth is in the you know, uh, same stocks. So that's skin in the game. Soul in the game is kind of next elevation of this, where what you do is so dear to you, where money becomes secondary. Where it's a money is just a kind of byproduct. It's a second derivative of what you do. When you have skin in the game, uh, soul in the game, you would never do anything too um, unethical. You would, not, would never do anything that uh, would violate your principles. Uh, you, when you have a soul in the game, and I think I, I keep thinking about the Jiro, you know, uh, Jiro of Susha guy, where all he thought was he had this incredible focus and he just thought about sushi. You have this incredible, so when you have soul in the game, you're very focused on what you do. Um, you try to be a net positive to the society. In other words, think about it. Imagine you're making sushi, but it makes, but you, you wouldn't want to eat it because it makes you sick. So, or you, you, know, you think, you know, you give it to people and it poisons them. So, it, you, know, it's, you know, it's very difficult to maintain soul in a game if it's not net positive for society. So that's what, uh, and I'm missing a few points, but that's what basically, you know, having soul in the game means to, you know, means to me. Something that is very dear to your heart that you do this with passion. And, uh, and it's meaningful. So to me, to me, investing is meaningful because especially in the environment we're in today, if I, you know, I, I feel like if investors just buy index funds, then for the next you know, 10, 15 years, they're going to have a very miserable existence. You know, they, the returns are very, very miserable. Um, and people come to us with their life savings. So that's incredible responsibility as well. Um, anyway, so that's kind of, that's, that's my thinking of, uh, that, that's what it means to have soul in a game. And creativity, you know, uh, that's what basically kind of energizes me every day. Uh, that's this is why I keep coming to work, and this is why. You know, by the way, this is why I write as well because I receive a lot of pleasure from this. And if I was uh, like I in the book, I keep referring to uh, assembly line work and fiat as a kind of as the example of not having as having zero creativity. And and I to me that's you know like if I if that was my existence, I would be miserable. You know, and having creativity in my life, that's actually, that's what kind of recharges my batteries. It gives you a lot of pleasure and, and also a lot of pain, I imagine, but this, this struggle suffering element is important. And, and this was such a great refresher for me, in particular, reading this book on, especially the stoicism part, where this idea that you, you, you can't avoid pain in your life. You, or, in order to live a good life, it actually requires 
something painful or suffering that these dramatic words we're using, but to your point, it has to be this good problem to solve that you have to want to get up and go do every day. Um, there was that Victor Frankl quote about needing pain. And so you look for good problems to solve, putting all these pieces together, basically having the creative element, looking for that inspiration, not having the, not being dissuaded by people like Buffett and Druckenmiller and Miller or whoever, who has gone on to be these titans of industry. There's still opportunity to break some rules and create, craft your own voice and be, uh, you know, create your own style and looking for things that are worthy of your time, worthy of the, the suffering that might go into it, knowing that that's what's required to have pleasure. I don't have a meaningful life at the end of the day. Vitaly, this was so insightful. I really love this book. I love the way you write. You, you in, inject all this humor along the way. I, I highly recommend people go pick up this book. It's called Soul in the Game. Uh, where can people find the book, find you, find your writings, find your fund, any other resources you want to share? Sure. So well, they, can buy, you know, they can find the book on Amazon or wherever the books are sold. However, if they go to soulinthegame.net and uh, there's a, instructions there and they send us a receipt of their purchase in the book, we'll send them bonus, chapter, bonus chapters. So that's a soulinthegame.net. Um, they can find my writings on contrarian edge edg.com and they can subscribe to my articles also unlike you guys we have a poor man's podcast meaning that it just basically my articles read to you by another fellow so it's not a true podcast um so if you like if you you know if you listen to this or watching this you must like uh, reading or listening more than like reading you know um so you like listening or watching more than like reading so investor.fm if you go there investor.fm then you can uh, subscribe to our podcast. And just again, just my articles read to you by, uh, by a professional reader. So, yeah. Vitaly, congratulations on the book. Um, really, really loved it. Really loved our conversation and I appreciate it. Let's do it again. That's right. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you guys, you do a phenomenal job. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 